Good morning. We have a new chapter of Princess and the Goblin that we're reading today. Chapter 15 called Woven and Then Spun. So at the end of the last chapter, Irene finally goes up to where she should have gone at the first um, time of seeing those goblin creatures. She goes up to her grandmother's tower. So that's where we're beginning our chapter today. Please follow along as we read chapter 15. If you have your own copy of the book, you can begin from there. Oops, sorry, I thought I went to the help me read this part. Here it is. Now come in, Irene, said the silvery voice of her grandmother. The princess opened the door and peeped in, but the room was quite dark and there was no sound of the spinning wheel. She grew frightened once more, thinking that although the room was there, the old lady might be a dream after all. Every little girl knows how dreadful it is to find a room empty where she thought somebody was. But Irene had to fancy for a moment that the person she came to find was nowhere at all. She remembered, however, that at night she spun only in the moonlight and concluded that must be why there was no sweet bee-like humming. The old lady might be somewhere in the darkness. Before she had time to think another thought, she heard her voice again, saying as before, come in, Irene. From the sound, she understood at once that she was not in the room beside her. Perhaps she was in her bedroom. She turned across the passage, feeling her way to the other door. When her hand fell on the lock, again the old lady spoke. Shut the other door behind you, Irene. I always close the door of my workroom when I go to my chamber. Irene wondered to hear her voice so plainly through the door. Having shut the other, she opened it and went in. Oh, what a lovely haven to reach from the darkness and fear through which she had come. The soft light made her feel as if she were going into the heart of the milkiest pearl, while the blue walls and their silver stars for a moment perplexed her with the fancy that they were in reality the sky, which she had just left outside a minute ago, covered with rain clouds. I've lighted a fire for you, Irene. You're so cold and wet, said her grandmother. Then Irene looked again and saw that what she had taken for a huge bouquet of red roses on a low stand against the wall was in fact a fire which burned in the shapes of the loveliest and reddest roses, glowing glo gorgeously between the heads and wings of two cherubs of shining silver. And when she came nearer, she found that the smell of roses with which the room was filled came from the fire roses on the hearth. Her grandmother was dressed in the loveliest pale blue velvet, over which her hair, which was no longer white, but of a rich golden color, streamed like a cataract, here falling in dull, gathered heaps, there rushing away in smooth, shining falls. And she looked, the hair seemed pouring down from her head and vanishing in a golden mist ere it reached the floor. It flowed from under the edge of a circle of shining silver set with alternated pearls and opals. On her dress was no ornament whatsoever. Neither was there a ring on her hand or a necklace or carcanet about her neck. But her slippers glimmered with the light of the Milky Way, for they were covered with seed pearls and opals in one mass. And her face was that of a woman of three and twenty, meaning twenty-three. The princess was so bewildered with astonishment and admiration that she could hardly thank her and drew nigh with timidity, feeling dirty and uncomfortable. So how has her grandmother changed? She looks young, she has blonde hair, she's more, even more beautiful than before. She was already beautiful. And she doesn't have any fancy um, jewelry on her, but she has these beautiful slippers. And um, she is just amazing, Irene. Now the lady was seated on a low chair by the side of the fire, remember the rose fire, with hands outstretched to take her, little Irene. But the princess hung back with a troubled smile. Why, what's the matter? Asked her grandmother. You haven't been doing anything wrong. I know that by your face, though it is rather miserable. What's the matter, my dear? And she still held out her hands, ready for Irene to come give her a hug. Dear grandmother, said Irene, 
I'm not so sure that I haven't done something wrong. I ought to have run up to you at once when the long-legged cat came in at the window, instead of running out on the mountain and making myself such a fright. You were taken by surprise, my child, and you are not so likely to do it again. It is when people do wrong things willfully that they are the more likely to do them again. Meaning the princess should have gone to see her grandmother and not gotten afraid. However, she didn't do it on purpose. So it's probably going to be that she will correct her mistake next time and go straight to her grandmother for help and not go outside where goblins could catch her. Come, her grandmother says, and still she held out her arms. But grandmother, you're so beautiful and grand with your crown on, and I'm so dirty with mud and rain. I should quite spoil your beautiful blue dress. With a merry little laugh, the lady sprung from her chair more lightly far than, than Irene herself could. She caught the child to her bosom and kissing the tear-stained face over and over, sat down with her in her lap. Her grandmother doesn't care that she's dirty. She still wants to hug her. Oh, grandmother, you'll make yourself such a mess, cried Irene, clinging to her. Oh, you darling, do you think I care more for my dress than for my little girl? Besides, look here. And as she spoke, she set her down, and Irene saw to her dismay that the lovely dress was covered with the mud of her fall on the mountain road. But the lady stooped to the fire and taking from it by the stalk in her fingers one of the burning roses, she passed it once and again and a third time over the front of her dress. And I, when Irene looked, not a single stain was to be discovered. There, said her grandmother, you won't mind coming to me now. But little Irene again hung her head back, eyeing the flaming rose which the lady held in her hand. You're not afraid of the rose, are you? she said, about to throw it on the hearth again. Oh, don't please, cried Irene. Won't you hold it to my frock and her dress and my hands and my face? And I'm afraid my feet and my knees want it too. No, answered her grandmother, smiling a little sadly as she threw the rose from her. It is too hot for you yet. It would set your frock in a flame. Besides, I don't want to make you clean tonight. I want your nurse and the rest of the people to see you as you are, for you will have to tell them how you ran away for fear of the long-legged cat. I should like to wash you, but they would not believe you then. Do you see that bath behind you? The princess looked and saw a large oval tub of silver shining brilliantly in the light of the wonderful lamp. Go and look into it, said the lady. Irene went and came back very silent with her eyes shining. What did you see? asked her grandmother. The sky and the moon and the stars, she answered. It looked as if there was no bottom to it. The lady smiled a pleased, satisfied smile and was silent also for a few minute, moments. Then she said, anytime you want a bath, just come to me. I know you have a bath every morning, but sometimes you want one at night too. Thank you, grandmother, I will. I will indeed, answered Irene, and was again silent for some moments, thinking. Then she said, How was it, grandmother, that I saw your beautiful lamp, not the light of it only, but the great round silvery lamp itself, hanging alone in the great open air high up? In the last chapter, remember, she saw the lamp itself floating in the uh, night sky. It was your lamp I saw, wasn't it? Yes, my child, it was my lamp. Just a moment. Then how was it? Irene asks. I don't see a window all round. When I please, I can make the lamp shine through the walls, shine so strong that it melts them away from before the sight and shows itself as you saw it. But as I told you, it is not everybody who can see it. How is it that I can then? I'm sure I don't know. It is a gift born with you. And one day I hope everybody will have it, her grandmother says. Irene says, how, but how do you make it shine through the walls? Ah, uh, that you would not understand if I were to try ever so much to make you. Not yet, not yet. But, added the lady, rising, you must sit in my chair while I get you the present I have been preparing for you. Maybe it's what she was spinning on her spinning wheel. 
I told you my spinning was for you. It is finished now and I am going to fetch it. I've been keeping it warm under one of my brooding pigeons. What do you think it is that she was spinning for her? Now Irene sat down in the low chair and her grandmother left her, shutting the door behind her. The child sat gazing now at the rose fire, now at the starry walls, now at the silver light, and a great quietness grew in her heart. If all the long-legged cats in the world had come rushing at her, then she would not have been afraid of them for even a moment. She knows that she is safe with her grandmother. That long-legged cat is nothing to be afraid of. How this was, she could not tell. She only knew there was no fear in her, and everything was so right and safe that it could not get in. She had been gazing at the lovely lamp for some minutes fixedly, but she was looking out on the dark, cloudy night. But though she heard the wind blowing, none of it blew upon her. In a moment more, the clouds themselves parted, or rather vanished like the wall, and she looked straight into the starry herds, flashing gloriously in the dark blue. It was but for a moment. The clouds gathered again and shut out the stars, the wall gathered again and shut out the clouds. And there stood the lady beside her with the loveliest smile on her face and a shimmering ball in her hand about the size of a pigeon's egg. There, Irene, there is my work for you, she said, holding out the ball to the princess. She took it in her hand and looked at it all over. It sparkled a little and shone here and there, but not much. It was of a sort of gray whiteness, something like spun glass. Is this all your spinning, grandmother? She asked. All since you came to the house. There is more there than you think. How pretty it is. But what am I to do with it, please? Grandmother Irene says, that I will now explain to you, answered the old lady, turning from her and going to her cabinet. She came back with a small ring in her hand. Then she took the ball from Irene's and did something with the ring Irene could not quite tell. Give me your hand, she said. Irene held up her right hand. Yes, that is the hand I want, said the old lady, and she put the ring on the forefinger of it. What a beautiful ring, said Irene. What is the stone called? It is a fire opal, her grandmother says. Please, am I to keep it? Always. Oh, thank you, grandmother. It's prettier than anything I ever saw, except those of all colors in your... Please, is that your crown? Yes, it is my crown, her grandmother says. The stone in your ring is of the same sort, only not quite so good. It has only red, but mine have all the colors you see. Yes, grandmother, I will take such care of it. But, she added, hesitating, but what, asked her grandmother. What am I to say when Ludie asks me where I got it? You will ask You will ask her where you got it, answered the lady smiling. Meaning if Ludie says, where did you get that? She says, where did I get it? I don't see how I can do that. You will though, she says. Of course I will if you say so, but you know, I can't, not, I can't pretend not to know, meaning, the princess does not lie. She can't lie. So if she knows where she got it, how is she going to act like she doesn't? Of course not, her grandmother says, but don't trouble yourself about it. You will see when the time comes. So saying, the lady turned and threw the little ball into the rose fire. Oh, grandmother, exclaimed Irene. I thought you had spun it for me. Well, so I did, my child, and you've got it. No, you just burnt it in the fire. The lady put her hand in the fire, brought out the ball, glimmering as before, and held it towards her. Irene stretched out her hand to take it, but the lady turned and going to her cabinet, opened a drawer and laid the ball in it. Have I done anything to vex you, grandmother? Said Irene pitifully. No, no, my darling, but you must understand that no one ever gives anything to another, to another properly, and really, without keeping it. That ball is yours. So she keeps it, but it's really for Irene. Oh, I'm not to take it with me? You're going to keep it for me? You are to take it with you, 
her grandmother says. I've fastened the end of it to the ring on your finger. So she has it ready, but Irene is wearing that ring and that's what's the connection. Irene looked at the ring. I can't see it there, grandmother. She said, feel a little way from the ring towards the cabinet, said the lady. Oh, I do feel it, exclaimed the princess, but I can't see it, she added, looking close to her outstretched hand. No, the thread is too fine for you to see it. You can only feel it. Now you can fancy how much spinning that took, although it does seem such a little ball. But what use can I make of it if it lies in your cabinet? That is what I will explain to you. It would be of no use to you, it wouldn't be yours at all, if it did not lie in my cabinet. Now listen, if ever you find yourself in any danger, such, for example, as you were in this same evening when the long-legged cat came, you must take off your ring and put it under the pillow of your bed. Then you must lay your finger, the same finger that wore the ring, upon the thread and follow the thread wherever it leads you. So if she puts her ring there and follows that thread, it will take her to a place which the grandmother says is going to help her in some way. Oh, how delightful. It will lead me to you, grandmother, I know. Yes, she says, but remember, it may seem to you a very roundabout way indeed. Maybe it takes her somewhere else before it takes her to her grandmother. And you must not doubt the thread. Of one thing you may be sure, that while you hold it, I hold it too. It is very wonderful, said Irene thoughtfully. Then suddenly becoming aware, she jumped up, crying, Oh, grandmother, here have I been sitting all this time in your chair, and you were standing. I beg your pardon. The lady laid her hand on her shoulder and said, Sit down again, Irene. Nothing pleases me better than to see anyone sit in my chair. I am only too glad to stand so long as anyone will sit in it. How kind of you, said the princess, and sat down again. It makes me happy, said the lady. But, said Irene, still puzzled, won't the thread get in somebody's way and be broken if the one end is fast to my ring and the other laid in your cabinet? And you know, stretched all this way, won't somebody come in between and break the thread? You will find all that arrange itself. I am afraid it is time for you to go. Mightn't I stay and sleep with you tonight, grandmother? She asks. No, not tonight. If I had meant you to stay tonight, I should have given you a bath. But you know, everybody in the house is miserable about you. They're looking for her, remember? And it'd be cruel to keep them so all night. You must go downstairs. I'm so glad, grandmother, you didn't say go home, for this is my home. Mayn't I call this my home? You may, my child, and I trust you will always think it your home. Now come, I must take you back without anyone saying you. Please, I want to ask you just one more question, said Irene. Is it because you have your crown on that you look so young? No, child, answered to her grandmother. It is because I felt so young this evening that I put my crown on, and I thought you would like to see your old grandmother in her best. Why do you call yourself old? You're not old, grandmother. Well, I am very old indeed. It is so silly of people. I don't mean you, for you are such a tiny and couldn't know any better. But it is so silly of people to fancy that old age means crookedness and witheredness and feebleness and sticks and spectacles and rheumatism and forgetfulness. It's so silly. Old age has nothing whatever to do with all of that. The right old age means strength and beauty and mirth and courage, and clear eyes, and strong, painless limbs. I am older than you are able to think, and, and look at you, grandmother, cried Irene, jumping up and flinging her arms about her neck. I won't be silly again, I promise you. At least, I'm rather afraid to promise, but if I am, I promise to be sorry for it. I do. I wish I were as old as you, grandmother. I don't think you are ever afraid of anything. Not for long, at least, my child, she says. Perhaps by the time I am 2,000 years of age, I shall indeed never be afraid of anything. But I confess I have sometimes been afraid about my children, including little Irene. Sometimes about you, Irene. Oh, I'm so sorry, grandmother. 
Tonight, I suppose you mean. Yes, a little tonight, she says. But a good deal when you had all but made up your mind that I was a dream and no real great-great-grandmother. You must not suppose I am blaming you for that. I dare say you couldn't help it. I don't know, grandmother, said the princess, beginning to cry. I can't always do myself as I should like, and I don't always try. I'm very sorry anyhow. The lady stooped, lifted her in her arms, and sat down with her in her chair, holding her close to her bosom. In a few minutes, the princess had stopped, sobbed herself to sleep. How long she slept, I do not know. When she came to herself, she was sitting in her own high chair at the nursery table with her doll's house before her. So that's the end of the chapter. Here is um, an image, a good illustration of what she might have looked like with her opal crown and long flowing blonde hair and little Irene coming to her. So this chapter might have been a little confusing at this point. Um, it will become more and more clear what, she, what the grandmother meant by it. Um, but just keep in mind what she said about the ring and the thread. The ring connects her to her grandmother in that opal ball that she has through this long invisible thread, which only Irene really knows is there. And it will lead her back to her grandmother, even if it's a roundabout way. Okay, so we'll see that come up soon in our chapter. That's all for today. I hope you enjoy, and I will see you soon. Bye.